Why does everyone seem to think that the U.S. dollar is going down? Is the U.S. dollar losing its dominance? We should prepare to lose our position as holder of the world's reserve currency. In my opinion, we are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too, too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. And one of the key arguments in favor of this worldview is the fact that the world's second largest economy wants to de-dollarize. Dollarization is when a country pairs its currency with the U.S. dollar. It's a move to stabilize your economy, particularly when there isn't a lot of trust in your domestic currency. This is a strategy that the new leader of Argentina, Javier Millet, is pursuing since Argentina has had multiple currency crises over the last few decades. De-dollarization is the opposite. When a country moves away from the dollar, it's aiming for sovereignty over its own currency and control of its monetary policy. And China sees itself as an ascending superpower, worthy of greater economic strength and independence. Weakening the US dollar's role as the global reserve currency would be an enormous geopolitical coup. The key question is, can they do it? In this video, we'll unravel China's desire to de-dollarize, their unique financial strategy, and examine whether they're capable of fundamentally reshaping our financial world. All currencies trade against one another. Some currencies, like the Hong Kong dollar, are pegged to a fixed exchange rate relative to the US dollar. Other currencies, like Japanese yen, have a floating exchange rate that shifts to reflect the relative economic sentiment between two economies. The Chinese yuan employs what is referred to as a managed float system. This means that the yuan is allowed to fluctuate in foreign exchange markets. But People's Bank of China, or PBOC, intervenes to manage its value. To do this, the PBOC references a basket of currencies that it wants to trade against. It includes the US dollar, the euro, the yen, some other currencies, but the US dollar is the primary fixture. 47% of China's own cross-border payments were denominated in the dollar in 2023, even though less than 20% of China's exports head to the United States. In order to exert more economic power on the world, China must lessen its dependence on its adversary's currency. In the PBOC's ideal scenario, the yuan would remain strong enough for China to buy what it needs abroad because it relies on imports to meet the energy and food needs of its population. To defend that trading band, the PBOC must hold US dollars. Here's why. If the yuan weakens too much, the PBOC must intervene and use those dollars to buy up yuan, boosting its value internationally. Unfortunately, this means that American economic policymakers can exert substantial economic and political power on the Chinese economy, meaning the US Federal Reserve can influence domestic Chinese politics. For example, if China were to become the target of sanctions, perhaps for invading Taiwan, which I already made a video about, then their dollar reserves could be frozen or seized. They'd also struggle to transact globally. The backbone of international finance is a system called SWIFT, which connects over 11,000 institutions in a secure network vital for global transactions. Chinese yuan accounted for one side of less than 4% of all SWIFT transactions. That's dwarfed by the greenback, which accounted for over 48% of all SWIFT transactions. So who has more influence to deny access to SWIFT? Exclusions from SWIFT would cripple a country's ability to engage in international financial transactions, cutting it off from the global economic community. And China's rise has been built on being an intermediate goods manufacturer, where they import raw materials, process them, then export those components for final assembly. A value-add manufacturer, which is a majority of Chinese businesses, would be destroyed if it was cut off from global trade. So you can see why they'd want to de-dollarize. Let's talk about what gets in the way. Every single economy faces a set of policy trade-offs that they must make. Financial authorities can choose only two of the following. 
One, a fixed exchange rate, where the country pegs its currency's value to another major currency like the US dollar. This can promote trade and investment through stability. Two, an independent monetary policy, where a country can set its interest rates and control its money supply based on domestic economic conditions. Or three, the free movement of capital, also called an open capital account, which allows for the unrestricted flow of capital in and out of the country. This can lead to increased investment opportunities, but can also make the economy vulnerable to sudden capital flight. No one can have all three, not even the US. Most large globalized economies choose to have control over their domestic monetary policy and an open capital account. This means that they cannot fix their exchange rate. The US, Australia, UK, Japan, and South Korea all follow this model. Their currencies fluctuate freely, which means they're open for business with foreign investors. Hard authoritarian countries like North Korea do not allow for the open flow of capital out of the country. Their capital account is closed it's an island financially and economically. In exchange, their independent monetary policy and fixed exchange rate keep things steady. Smaller economies like Hong Kong, Latvia, Panama give up domestic monetary control in order to have an open capital account and a fixed exchange rate. This move creates stability and makes their economies more credible to outside investors, which allows them to integrate into global trade. The trade-off is that they end up importing someone else's monetary policy. For Hong Kong and Panama, it's the US Federal Reserve. For Baltic states like Latvia, it's the European Union. China is an interesting case. The managed float of the yuan keeps the currency at a relatively fixed exchange rate. They also conduct independent monetary policy, setting interest rates in response to domestic politics. But this is an authoritarian regime. They'd prefer that it be difficult for people to get their money out of the country. Just one problem. They conduct over $4 trillion of gross trade flows annually. That is a lot of money moving across the border. So what do they do? If you were to think of the ideal capital control system, you would think of a surveillance state where every single transaction was tracked and some central authority could look at each one and say, yep, you're good, or no, 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 you're not good. But since China opened to the global economy under Deng Xiaoping in 1978, that's more than 50 years ago, there are over 1 million entities in China licensed to do foreign transaction. It is impossible to sort the flow of capital in and out. So instead, China sets a limit on how much can flow out of the country at any given time. Transactions out of the country will be delayed until enough capital flows back into China to even things out. That means if there's $5 billion set to leave China today and only $3 billion flows in, $2 billion of that outflow is going to be held back until more money comes in the door. It's forced balancing of flows by central decree. China is trying to partially hold all three sides of the impossible trinity, and its grip is slipping. Eventually, China will have to give up one of these three. They could completely close their capital account and give up their globalized economics. They'd be like a larger North Korea, but that is completely incompatible with Xi's vision of China as a great power. If they open their capital account and keep the fixed exchange rate, they would no longer be able to stimulate the economy create easy money conditions, and prop up their domestic assets. Inevitably, they'd face an enormous asset bubble pop, akin to what Japan went through back in the 1990s when real estate prices fell more than 70%. This would be extremely risky for a single party state like the CCP. They'd take 100% of the blame in an economic crisis. And if Chinese households lost 70% of their net worth, citizens will not be happy. So the only rational path forward is to seed their currency peg. If the current ratio is seven yuan to each dollar, a currency adjustment could see that climb to 10, 12, 13, or higher. In that world, all the debt that has built up in the Chinese system gets devalued. They avoid default, 
but their ability to spend internationally weakens substantially. As Yuan weakens, a far larger portion of their budget would have to be allocated to basic necessities like energy and food imports. It would be a humbling move, and it would require China's one-party state to relinquish the control that it has clung to so tightly for more than half a century. So hopefully you now understand that all the stories about de-dollarization are wildly overblown. To put an even finer point on it, the US dollar accounts for about 54% of foreign exchange reserves. Dollar reserves dwarf the volume of all other reserve currencies. And two US allies, the Euro and Japanese Yen, account for 19 and 5% of reserves respectively. The result of all this pressure is coming to a head within the Chinese system. And this precarious situation makes me more nervous about the risk of China invading Taiwan. I made an entire other video all about it. But suffice to say, if China's economic situation gets worse, I could see a military move being used by leadership to distract the public from domestic problems and use a foreign adversary like the US to pin the blame on. Let's hope it doesn't happen.